So uh, to get this started, uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Tim Ash, the president pro tem of the Senate. Uh, so um, welcome. All right. Well, thank you, uh, committees, and welcome everybody. I'm glad you were able to make it for part two, take two of Working Lands Day. I know the other one got snowed out. I'll just tell you, it was about eight or nine years ago, a committee room just around the corner, there were, I was standing there with four other senators, Bobby was one of them, and Ginny Lyons, who's still in the Senate, was one, and there were two others, as the legislation that created the Working Lands Program was being drafted and finalized, and somewhere on the second floor, there were some House members doing the exact same thing. It was late at night in April, and I don't think we could have imagined then how much success we would have had with the investments we've been making in the Working Lands Program. Uh, when it was first pitched to us, I feel like it was 2011 or 12, my years get a little mixed, but when it was first being pitched, people were saying, this program promises to make exactly the kind of investments that double down on what is best about Vermont, a triple bottom line approach of people who take care of our lands, people who want to invest in rural communities, local food, local uh, wood products and so on. And we kind of took a chance when we first passed that legislation that that would come to fruition. But I think um, the handouts that you're looking at now show dozens and dozens of investments all throughout the state in communities who need it most, creating jobs, creating economic activity. And I think it really has furthered exactly the kind of goals that were promised in the beginning. And uh, I'll just say this is because I'm not going to be the in the Senate anymore after this year. This is the last time. And I don't know how many of you, some, I know many of you will be familiar with the show Leave It to Beaver, all right? <laughs> so if you remember, my favorite character on that show was Eddie Haskell. You know, he was always around, I was like, uh, Beaver's mom. And so I'm not typically Eddie Haskell, but since I'm leaving, I can do it. And I just wanted to acknowledge Paul Costello's role. Uh, I don't believe that without Paul's advocacy, we would have created the Working Lands Board and Fund. It wouldn't have been sustained and it wouldn't have grown over the years. And so many of you will benefit from the work that Paul has done on the advocacy side, but I do just want to especially acknowledge his role. There have been many others, of course, but Paul really was the kind of magnetic north on this one. So I want to thank Paul. Thank you. And, and I would like to uh, say that, you know, we're going to miss uh, Tim in the Senate uh, next year, or whoever's there, but if I'm there, I'm going to really miss him. When I, when he was first elected uh, President Pro Tem, he called me into the office and he said, you know, Bobby, he said, uh, I may be out of Chittenden County, but I really care about the other Vermont out there. And I want you to do rural development and, and some forestry issues and things like that to help rural Vermont out. And, uh, you know, I, I never forgot that and have appreciated that and, and all of his support uh, <clears throat> over the last six years uh, while he's been speaker. And, Hopefully, hopefully we'll have him as our lieutenant governor and uh, and uh, Bobby, you've done enough. You know, not <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, appreciate all your help over the years. So now we'll get right to it, well, Carolyn. All right. So um, we're going to be hearing from some folks, uh, and Lindsay, you're up first. <coughs> here. Yeah, please, and if you can introduce yourself, uh, that would be great. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Lindsay Curley. I'm the Secretary of Commerce and Community Development, and it's truly my uh, honor to be here today to address you um, on the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative Day, Legislative Day in the State House. I'm amongst the seventh generation in my family to live on the family farmland in Middlesex. And some of my most favorite childhood memories are time spent with my cousins working on my grandparents' farm. Whether we were gathering sap during sugaring season or stacking hay bales in the heat of the summer to prepare for the long winter ahead, I couldn't have known it then, but I look back and I will always value the time that I spent with my family 
working on the farmland. So like so many Vermonters, the working landscape is part of my heritage and was once my family's sole source of income. Though we no longer farm on the land, I do hold dear what that land has meant to me. I live there still today. And I can't help but wonder if there had been opportunities made possible, like those that are offered through the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative, if my family might still be making a living on our farm. The Working Lands Enterprise Initiative encourages economic growth by supporting entrepreneurs in the working lands industries. The initiative brings leaders of agriculture, forestry, and commerce together with budding entrepreneurs to encourage innovation through public and private funding sources, including loans and grants. These programs directly impact businesses and service providers by helping to improve the infrastructure and create jobs while pre protecting Vermont's land. Successful business owners know they must continually make investments in order to grow their business and have to take risks. These programs support businesses through these critical growth stages and help mitigate the risks that must be taken to bring their companies to the next phase. We take pride in the work that we're doing to support and invest in the food, farm, and forest industries, and I'm honored to be part of it. Growing and investing in the working lands enhances the lives of all Vermonters, and our goal is to promote an active, working, and vibrant landscape, the foundation of Vermont's communities, families, and our economy. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Lizzie. <laughs> yes. Oh, and uh, shall I introduce the next? Reading? Sure. Okay. So it is my honor to introduce Secretary Anson Tebbett, Secretary of Agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Um, with your permission, I'd like to just introduce a couple of people from the agency who really manage this program and are doing a, a bang up job with it. It's a Deputy Eastman is here as well, and, and Lynn Allen, who's our program manager, who's put this all together and manages it year round. So I just want to recognize their leadership in making this program uh, so successful. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to be here today. It's an honor as always, and uh, we appreciate the. Uh, ongoing uh, support of working lands. Uh, we're all working extremely hard to try to improve the rural economy of Vermont. And this is an important program uh, to reach that goal. Uh, this program makes uh, Vermont more affordable by investing in infrastructure to those small companies. Uh, Governor Scott is well behind this program, believes in it, and has uh, put some dollars, extra dollars, in his budget this year because of his strong endorsement of this program. This program brings the leaders of agriculture, of commerce, forestry, and all those that make their living off the land together. We're all leveraging those uh, precious dollars that you folks have to manage to grow the Vermont economy, and we appreciate the, the ongoing support of this committee and the committees uh, throughout the legislature for this, this approach. Support for food, farm, and forestry is critical uh, to Vermont's future. You'll hear some personal stories today where companies have had to take a big risk uh, to get their businesses uh, to the next level. These investments by the Working Lands Program encourage innovation, and in many cases, uh, these companies get to the next level uh, because of this program. They add jobs, uh, they're creating more products, they're growing their operations, and growing uh, the Vermont economy. We all need an active, working and vibrant landscape and this program is critical uh, to that success and that success goes beyond the farms it's also about the forests thank you uh, uh, thank you uh always a pleasure to join on working lands day um and uh in, you know senator ash referenced uh, was it 2012 or so uh, the, some late nights uh, here, down here, and upstairs, and I was here then as commissioner, and was uh, run, remember running back and forth, uh, upstairs and down, and uh, and um, it really was something. And I think it's appropriate to reflect back and to realize. I don't think we, we all thought there was real promise to this premise, um, but it's really amazing to see uh, what has come of it and the people um, who are who make it work uh, from our staff, uh, our partners and importantly, the recipients of the green lights, the farm and forest owners of the state. And that's, I'm gonna be brief, I think we all want to be, because you want to hear from, you should hear from them, grantees, and that their stories are always amazing. Uh, I like to say, um, when we make things like world 
class food and forest products, furniture, etc. We make Vermont. We make the best of Vermont, and it's uh, this is a working landscape in in that it. Uh, works in an ecological way by scrubbing carbon dioxide, by cleaning water, uh, providing flood resilience, right? These, it's working whether we're here or not, but it's the, so the landscape works, and this working landscape that we're talking about is the people who work that landscape in a close, careful, intelligent way with all kinds of co-benefits and, and impact. Um, and it's really worth celebrating, and I want to just thank all of you for continuing to support uh, all of our partners who have helped build it. Uh, at the beginning, it was an idea, and we had to build a grant program and a board and process uh, while also putting money out and trying to um, quantify impact. And I just think it's a, a raging success. So um, I want to also just be quick to thank, on our part, I've been a, as, as you know, there's the three uh, agencies that are uh, um, to the board. Mm -hmm. And in the early going, I was there and, and served on the board. Uh, a few years ago when we uh, added Deputy Lincoln to our team, Sam was kind enough to take over the day-to-day -day function as my designee on the board, and he's done a fantastic job. So I want to thank Sam. And our lead staff are mm -hmm. Essex Caledonia County Forester, Matt Langless, and uh, our wood utilization program lead, Paul Frederick, who provide a lot of technical assistance and really do a lot of work on top of their normal jobs. So I, I really want to single them out and thank them. Uh, in, in, in uh, a couple of quick notes, just to, to the, the, this is about, about to reflect sort of a nimbleness, and I think in adapting to change and continuing opportunities and challenges, the board continues to think about what, where to go next and how, examples being the recent decision to scale up forest, uh, forest impact investments in, in 19, focused on uh, you know, low-grade wood markets as well as dairy, uh, just a, a larger uh, impact model. Uh, and uh, along the supply chain. Uh, and uh, also, uh, another quick shout out would be to Ski Vermont. I think it's an interesting, they've been uh, significantly providing uh, support uh, over the years, $50,000 I think to date. And I just think it's a nice way of reflecting that we have this important working landscape that supports the land and land health economies, and we tend to focus on that. But remember, it's also culture and our way of life and our quality of life. <coughs> And that includes the recreational pursuits of the state. And uh, Ski Vermont's interest and investment in the program is just one reflection of that. That's co-benefits uh, that are totally uh, consistent um, for providing for outdoor recreation as well and the big impacts that come from it. Um, lastly, just uh, we have a business skills committee chaired by Sam Lincoln. Uh, and working with the Ag Agency, Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, and others, uh, uh, about to uh, pursue the, de the development and launch of a, a new platform, an online directory, a working lands business development directory, making it easier to find professionals like service providers um, as a tool for searching and contact information just to connect people and make it easier. So um, we're excited uh, to launch that new platform today. And I think I would then um, introduce uh, the program manager, uh, Linnell Schmoller, to, uh, to take it from there and explain Thanks. that. Thank you. So thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm actually going to ask one of my colleagues to come up and help me, Lauren Masseria. Lauren Masseria is another of the public to I am. Um, I work for the Agency of Agriculture, and I do marketing and promotions. Good morning again. So I'm Lynn Allen Schmoller, and I'm the program manager for the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. Really thrilled to be here today, and thank you so much for your continued support of a really impactful and important program for the state. So I really want to give more time to the past grantees, so I'm going to be pretty quick here. As Commissioner Snyder said, this is a platform um, that I want to give some kudos to Ellen Kaler. She's here from Plant Sustainable Jobs Funds. We've been collaborating on this for the last several months, and Lauren is actually, we're going to do a little bit of role playing here. Um, but first, I just want to, a couple quick points. The tool allows for a search of the contact information of various service providers who have particular expertise a business might be looking for. The directory only contains a listing of nonprofit and public sector organizations that provide these services. There are also many private consultants who also work with working lands businesses. And the directory is not intended to preference any service provider over another but simply make the information available to working lands businesses to then take the next step. 
and our intention is to continue recruiting providers to join the directory. So Lauren owns a farm and food business, and if everyone just wants to give their attention to the screen, this is the portal. So she owns a farm and food business. She has seven years of success as a fruit grower, and she also produces value-added fruit preserves. So she's cooking on to value-added. She's got five employees. She recently added two. Her brother is a lead trainer and human resources manager, which has enabled her to spend time in the bigger picture of the operations. She recently went through a successful land transfer with her aunt, and now she's actually looking to add goats to the new parcel of land since she just learned cheese making from Kate Turcotte. And so she's actually gonna click on to dairy as well. Kate suggested that Lauren dust off her existing business plan and start fresh. She is located in Wyndham County, so she's gonna click on Wyndham County. And she's kind of unsure of what stage of business development she's in. She's had good growth. Is it early? Is it growth? She hovers over the descriptions, she sees the definition, and she clicks growth. This is the perfect way to describe her needs. She really enjoys networking in a classroom setting, so she's gonna choose workshop as her desired approach. Uh, also clicking business planning there at the top. And then she's gonna hit search and as she scrolls down, she's gonna find that there's actually four programs that match her needs. The website links are there. She can click onto the website, and from there she can determine who will be the best match for services for her business. So if you have questions, you do have a handout today. It does have my contact information, but I do wanna shift back to Secretary Tebbets and some conversations with grantees. Thank you so much. Well, that's, that's pretty awesome because, yeah. you know, as we, in state government, if, if we can make it convenient and easy for folks and efficient without a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, and they can go right to it, mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be incredibly helpful for our, for our people that are looking to expand their businesses. So that's kind of cool. So grantees, so grantees, um, I don't know, what, where do you want them up the line? You want to? Well, most of them hope are in the front. I do okay. see Pete Coleman stuff. Right, Pete, you, you want to again? Sure. So come on, why don't you talk to me? But you want to back with me first? <laughs> Not that I want to. Not to get back to work making that wonderful product. So. Uh, yeah. All right, so go into right it. Pete, some of you may know Pete. Yes. Pete. Hi, everyone. So, Pete, introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Hi, my name is Pete Coleman. My company is Vermont Silvermine. Uh, we make value added pork products predominantly. Uh, yeah, We're, it's all, all pork. Um, <laughs> Sausage, salami. Uh, I know we have a new beef product as well. We started making Brasavola. It's, uh, um, it's a product that hails from northern Italy. It comes from the eye around in the back of a cow's leg. Um, anyway, we started uh, nine years ago selling sausages to farmers markets in Montpelier and Burlington, working out of a room about as big as this, attached to my apartment. And we started selling wholesale and slowly grew and then Started working with Vermont Packing House in Southern Vermont. They started doing all of our raw fabrication. We utilized Maverick Food Hub to develop a line of salami. And a year ago, about now, we broke ground on a project in downtown Barrie. Um, and we took over the old Homer Fitz building. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. Been vacant for, I don't think it's had a successful running business. I mean, just there's been a few people taking the rent there, but no one's made it work. Since I think Mr. Fitz did. Since Homer left. Since Homer did. <laughs> yeah, I think Homer was the last guy to make a, a real run at it. Um, and I, um, I love the space. It's I'm I'm very happy. You know, we're doing manufacturing in the back. We plan to utilize the front portion as a retail component, as kind of a marketing branch. I think we can actually do numbers there too. I think it'll be. I think it'll work. Um, and yeah. I was the recipient of a pretty significant amount of money, and that helped make this happen. You know, I've kind of bootstrapped this from the start. We've never taken on a lot of debt. I'm still the only owner. Um, I'm in more debt now than I've ever been, but it's actually pretty manageable, I think, for where we're at as a company. We, um, we're now selling product all the way to Ithaca, New York, Portland, Maine, and we just started getting a couple of accounts down Maryland, 
Pennsylvania, and even a couple in West Virginia. So we're excited. And this new space allows us to pull up. We have so much capacity now, so much capacity, um, which we're really excited about. But I think, you know, speaking to the working lands, um, you know, it's evidently valuable for me, but I think what's really important is, I mean, I think it's really important for if, if maintaining this, I don't know, agricultural economy here in Vermont, if that's what you all want to do, then I think as a business owner, I've seen that you got to make investments. It doesn't, like, I mean, whether it's a relationship, whether it's your garden out back, you either have to put in time or resources one way or the other. And I think the diversity that this can create and help build is really nice too, because it's not just whatever dairy or just woods. I think there's it's a spread which is really valuable because I think uh, I think it's becoming evident to us that we need to create kind of some some diversify our you know the, the way we generate revenue in the state, and I think this is a good way to do it. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think you know part of it. If, if that's your goal, if that's what you want to do, I think this is a very, very viable way to get it done. Um, and I, and as a small business owner, this money is crucial. Like, this is it can be. I don't know. I want to say maybe it's the type of thing where maybe it's not a make or break, but maybe it's the type of thing where all of a sudden you take on an equity partner and you lose some control of that business, or maybe that's the value also I see in it. Um, is that it, it's just, and that as I've grown, it's taken more time and more cash than I would have ever imagined. And that's why I think these, just these little, these little injections here and there really change the business or allow us to make these, you know, steps. Like we were in the Matter of Food Hub able to produce, you know, like mm, four to 500 pounds of salami or dry cured meats. So, and now, you know, we're in a space where we'll be able to hang 45,000 pounds eventually. You know, we, it'll take a while, but like, we can sell product in there. It's like, we can, we can be a formidable business and before we couldn't. And I think these are the little, the help that just, you know, get business owners to go, I'm gonna go for it, here we go. Um, yeah, so I don't know, I just <laughs> thank all of you for the support of what you're doing. And I also think, yeah, it's, you know, I can thank you all for it. if you do want to maintain this, a viability in your ag business is, I think you gotta invest in it. It's just, I just don't see any way around it, actually. Um, and you can rely on the private sector to do it all on their own, but it's also great to see a partnership. Pete, um, have you had any challenges sourcing enough work to keep you going? No, we, we are now having to utilize a lot more out of state. The, if you want to invest in the pork market in state, I think uh, the viability of it would be a good thing to analyze, but also scaling it. You know, the there's not a lot of large size scale or scaled hog farming here. I think one nice part is the consistency in the price point that out of state suppliers provide you with. Also, will then allow from pork cons being able to purchase a lot more from in-state as well because what I've found in my past, um, I bought a lot of pigs in Vermont, um, is that consistency and price point are big hurdles. Um, and even just being able to say, yeah, I need 4,000 pounds of hams. Um, people just go, yeah. <laughs> next year, I'll put them in 50 pound boxes and freeze them over the course of a year. And so, uh, the, the scale is not there, All right. and it, that's a good problem for me. You know, I'm happy to be there finally to have to kind of go. Yeah, we used to buy out, you know, three pigs a week, and I'd cut them up, and I'd do this and that. But we're just not. That model is no longer for us. Um, yeah, thanks. But I also think it's worthwhile to even say is that I, I don't know. I think it, having more Vermont pigs is really valuable. But I, I like the idea of it. But maybe it, it isn't functional. Well, I mean, I don't know. I think you have to look like, well, if these, if these, some of these farms are at like 4,000 hogs a week or something, and we're at 40 for our largest farm, um, where is the sweet spot where they need to be, where they can be competitive on price and provide the consistency? But maybe until you're at 2,000 or 3,000 hogs a week, maybe it doesn't even make, I don't know. It might. I think it's good to be able to grow your business utilizing sometimes a more affordable and consistent product, or rely on those who that's what they've been doing forever, you know? Okay. Like, Thanks. Yep. How many people do you employ? Uh, currently, not that many, because we do all of our raw fabrication at Vermont Packing House, 
So they have seventy employees. I got a bookkeeper. I got a full time production manager. I've got um, and a couple people that help me with um, some. Other. I also pay someone in state to help with out of state sales. Um, but yeah, we keep it pretty lean. Yeah. But we'll change that. But I don't. I don't see us ever having too too many employees. Currently, the way we're structured. Yeah. Well, you never know. Who knows? Who knows what could happen? Yeah. <coughs> business has changed. Business has changed. The way you do business changed. You know, maybe someday I'll say, hey, you know, we don't need to be working with the Vermont Packing House anymore. I'm going to start doing all the grinding and stuff and uh, et cetera, et cetera, and build some, you know, much bigger. And who knows? Maybe a bunch of uh, large size chain grocery stores around the U.S. start picking up our products, and we say, yeah, we have to do that. Brian has a question. Peter, how did you first hear about the Working Lands Initiative? Ooh, that's a really good question. Mm, I think I've been, I've looked for grants in the past. I think I've also just been in the circle of other food producers and... Well, you mentioned you're at the farmer's market, so maybe talking to somebody there. And yeah, you know, I haven't done farmer's market in probably eight years, but... Um, probably through Mad River, right? Yeah, probably Ro yeah. Robin or... I mean, I just know a chunk of the folks in the room as well, and I mean, I grew up in Montpelier, and kind of right around here, so I, I don't know. I can't even remember. I don't remember the shiny moment when it was something that was brought to my attention. Just curious. Thanks. Yep. Um, good. 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 Well, John. thank you. Uh, John. Um, John. 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 Just quickly, um, how I noticed uh, you're the only uh, business who has Vermont in its... Uh, business name mm -hmm. and so we, this came up yesterday during dairy marketing um is that how's that helped you or, or added to your story um i think there's an inherent like perceived value associated with the name um i wouldn't say you no know, i think people get interested but i also don't think it's i think it's valuable i think we do like i said have an inherent perceived quality associated with us but i Honestly, when I name the company, I think I literally, I'm really bad at naming things. And we're just like, shit, here we go. <laughs> Let's go. Better just to do it. Um, I don't think I really, I wasn't like, this is going to be my, well, all the, all the doors are going to magically open because I got Vermont in front of the words to look me. Um, to be honest, I kind of don't like my name, but I'm just doing it. <laughs> um, I can't. I mean, I think your company name or your personal name? <laughs> My personal name was changed actually when I was eight, so um, oh, you could change it again. I could. Vermont. I could. <laughs> yeah, never mind. Yeah, yeah, Vermont. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think there is a value. I think I wouldn't say people were like, oh, I I, I definitely opened my door to you because you had that Vermont name. Um, yeah, it doesn't. I still have to work <laughs> to get the sales done. Oh, yeah. um, and I think, you that'll know, on the shelf... That'll never end. That'll never end, will it? No, I think on the shelf it probably helps a little bit. There's, I mean, I can't, I can't give you, like, a tangible, real... I think it's, a, I think it's got value. I don't think it, it's not to make a break kind of business whatsoever. I, just, I would just add, I think this is a great... This is a, a win, win story because he started sort of the ag aspect, but now he's gone to a downtown that needs some help, we all know, which I think is an important component. I've toured the facility, it's gorgeous, and then when he gets his retail operation open as well, I think he's going to be supporting some other ag-related food businesses. So I think it's it's kind of neat that he's started in the hills and now he's um, also uh, helping in downtown, which is uh, important as well. I, I will chime in on that. I do think actually that a lot of these downtown spaces that are, you know, 9,000 square feet where it's like, what, what do you do with that? And like, it's too small for a box store. It's way too big for a mom and pop, something or other. It doesn't have a ton of parking. What do you do with it? And I think these mixed use kind of manufacturing and retail could be a good, kind of good approach to tackling those um, or breaking them up or something. But yeah, those, those buildings were empty, have been totally empty for a long time. And I don't think, I mean, I don't think my landlord is pretty, pretty excited to have conversations about renting it. Chris? <laughs> I want to go back to the supply and, and do you get any uh, Vermont pork right now? Uh, we get some Vermont pork and some Vermont beef. Um, we're working on a whole muscle line, which will. Part of my challenge too is our product lines are made predominantly from two cuts of meat. Um, we're 
working on developing a whole muscle line, which would incorporate more. So carcass utilization is one of the biggest challenges. Um, and so, like I said, if I'm like, oh, I need 4,000 pounds of hams, the farmer is like, well, what do I do with the rest? What do I do with the rest? So in part of what we're doing now is developing this uh, a program that would incorporate all cuts of the animal. And I think that will allow us to much easier purchase whole animals, which keeps, I think, the farmer's task super simple. Um, and then allows us to develop a product line from that. And in, you know, we started like all Vermont everything, all Vermont garlic, all Vermont wine, all Vermont pigs. I used to cut them all. Like, and I literally went to the farmer that I was working with and I showed him a spreadsheet. And I said, do you see where this is going? Like, we're done with both of us in six months or whatever, you know? And so I think longer term, I think what I see is a good portion of out of state meat, but help, you know, where we have better margin and, you know, able to buy. I think we'll have a few product lines that we sell a lot more volume of, and relying on some out of state pork will really help us make that happen. But then being able to create product lines that we can utilize. And also, just working with farms, I found that buying whole animals keeps their job super simple. If you can t alleviate that, like, we need your bellies, your hands, and your shoulders, but then you're stuck with the rest. And you know, we're at enough of a volume now where like, if you're stuck with the rest, it's a lot to get stuck with if you don't have a market for it. Um, so part of my goal would be to develop something that takes that burden off of them and allows us to do it. And I think we can do it. I've, I've sometimes wondered if, if you know, we have small, pro small farms, basically, and, and some small producers that we're helping kind of get, get bigger. And, I wondered if there's a role for us to try to, maybe through working lands and food hubs, and try to do this in different ways, but an aggregator that, that you could turn to instead of trying to deal with individual farms. That's the other thing I always found challenging is, you know, you buy from two or three super small farms, just the logistics of it, you know, like I'm, I'm you know, I showed up late to this meeting. Could you imagine me trying to organize three farms and get in the pork to land at the slaughterhouses and the pickups and this and that? Like, this is yeah. not going to happen. I'm gonna, <laughs> um, I think what I also found too when you got two really small businesses working together, sometimes it's really challenging because everyone's still kind of bootstrapping it. Everyone is like one little mistake is like <gasps> yeah. choking feeling on both sides. Whereas if you're working with really a larger producer and they really help you scale, I think then I could see if once we become a much more formidable company, it'd be easier for me to take on some smaller pork farmers and just be like, just send us what you can. Like, just like oh, whatever, your pigs were a little off weight this week, we'll just grind them all. Like, I don't know, just, I think then you can absorb those, those challenges, or the, uh, that learning curve. But if both parties are learning at the same time, and you're both making mistakes, I think it's really detrimental to both companies. But if you have, you're working with a really formidable company that's consistent and provides a price point where you can make money, then, yeah, that would be kind of my approach. Did anybody shop at Homer Fitz? Remember, <laughs> they, they had change, right? That you pay, and the change would go up the pneumatic tube and then come back. It's in my office. So, 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 yes, yeah, so you got to reinstitute that when you have a retail space. You don't need to hook up the vacuum lines, but right. if anyone wants any signs, I've got some signs in the basement. Oh, so wow. Yeah, I can try to get it back to the family. I've the only seen one. connected to it. So. No, I've got his, uh, Eric, right? Eric is like his, uh, I don't know what the, Eric Levine, I think. Anyway, um, and if you want some signs, come on. I try to give as many of them as the way to the family as I could. But. Good. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Thanks for We're not opposed to out of state pork as long as it comes from Washington. Right? Uh, thank you for having me. Some of you uh, know me, some of you don't. Um, I was one of those early pork producers that was working with Pete at the very beginning. And uh, that was challenging, and although it did, it did help grow my business. Um, I have a little bit of a different story for you. Um, my farm began uh, in Middlesex and was a three-acre, tiny little farm. Um, I was a teacher at the Romney Elementary School, and I wanted to find a way to stay home with my kids and do something meaningful. And so I decided that farming was a great idea. Yeah. And turns out it's pretty challenging. But 
what, what we did was we signed up with Farm Viability. And Farm Viability took our farm from this tiny little diversified farm. We started the first year, I think we did 20 pigs and 50 chickens, <clears throat> broilers, and yeah, 50 turkeys. And it grew to, um, on that location, we ended, we did, uh, we bought the Vermont uh, slaughterhouse Slaughter. for chickens, mobile. the mobile unit, yeah. and we started producing um, inspected chicken. And we did that first year, we did uh, 2,000 broilers. Uh, Farm Viability helped us uh, write our business plan to be able to actually grow um, and support ourselves by farming entirely. And we uh, were able to then move to Glover, where we live on a farm that's 188 acres. Uh, we grew the farm to, um, we did 6,000 broilers. We did um, about 100 hogs a year. We had a herd of 60 beef. And I was like, we're doing everything and we are great. <laughs> um, then, you know, as the farm really grew, we, we used, we, I leaned on farm viability a lot and learned how to uh, analyze the enterprises that were making money and the enterprises that were not making money. And I would say that um, the most important thing that we got out of the farm viability was business planning because I kind of went into the whole farm with a dream and thought, like, I can, I can just work. I will just work my way to make this happen, and you can't do that. Um, so, uh, got divorced. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry to laugh. <laughs> no, no, you can laugh. It's okay. Um, I got divorced, and the farm, I had to make a big decision about what I was going to do with the farm. Was I going to stay farming? Was I going, was I going to be able to do this? I have three children, um, so could I sustain a, a farm by myself uh, with minimal employees? And uh, that's when I went back to Farm Viability, and Sam helped me a lot. Um, and I applied for a working lands grant to scale up my laying hen business. And so we went from about 1,000 laying hens to 2,800 laying hens. And I would not have been able to do that without the working lands. It would not have happened. And I wouldn't have been able to keep my farm to be able to stay there um, and raise my kids. So we, we, we kind of pared down on the other enterprises. I sold the uh, slaughterhouse. Raising chickens and glover um, broilers is really hard on pasture. And so laying hens are hardier. and. Um, I was able to do that and ran the farm after receiving the grant and building. What the grant did for me was allowed me to build m large, efficient, mobile chicken houses that could house 500 chickens per house. And um, it, it allowed me to grow my business and I got to about 1,500 dozen eggs a week. We were selling them all through Vermont and New England, um, and I eventually, and we grew to, we had about eight employees. So farm viability also taught me about payroll and job creation and all of that stuff that's, that's really imperative, especially in the Northeast Kingdom. And I wasn't really aware of the culture of the Northeast Kingdom until I got there. And there's amazing farmland and amazing farmers and people who need jobs. And so um, we were doing something meaningful. Um, I ended up last year deciding that the, the work, what my kids needed and what we needed as a family was changing. And so um, I made the decision to um, transfer my laying hen business to two different farms, to Black Dirt Farm and to Patrick's um, Pastured Poultry there in Rhode Island. Um, and so even though I'm not 
doing it right now anymore. What I have done is helped these other businesses scale up and be profitable and and be able to feed their communities and run laying, profitable laying hen businesses. Like I, I loved getting to be a laying hen egg farmer. It was a lot of work, but we fed a lot of people because some people can't afford to buy a eight dollar a pound pork chop, but they can buy a dozen eggs for five dollars, and they know that they're good eggs, and so. The, the way that my, my farm went through so many transitions and bumps in the road and um, now I'm not farming, but my farm, my 188 acres is active. Um, Jasper Hill leased my, all my farmland for the last couple of years that I wasn't using. And this year, Young View Farm, who is a working lands recipient and they are producing cheese um, is using my land. And so, even though my story isn't like, yay, I'm still just churning out eggs, what, what Working Lands did was help me scale up and help me keep my farm and, and teach me about business so that I knew what I needed to do and when I needed to do it. Um, I really think that's, that's most of it. <laughs> Pretty good story. And now I am the uh, director of marketing at Northeast Kingdom Human Services in Newport and St. Johnsbury, and it's funny because it's kind of similar. Um, <laughs> um, they look a lot like your chickens. I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm them all. Um, no, but. But farming is about marketing. It's about telling the story. Why is it so important that people should invest in in local products? What, you know, what it what is the importance there? And and that those skills that I received from farming, learning how to tell the story, learning how to market the products. That's it's hard. It's hard to get out there. And at when you when you get to to a larger scale, like selling 800 dozen eggs a week was pretty easy. Selling 1,600 dozen eggs a week was hard. And I had to work really hard. And now I'm doing this job that I would not be able to do, which is marketing why it's important to take care of your brain, basically. And I would never be able to do that job if I hadn't done this job. Um, and one last thing is I'm, um, I'm also helping other farms and foresters in the Northeast Kingdom write working lands grants now and helping them with their business planning and none of that would have ever been possible um, if I hadn't been able to do receive these the skills that I received from from farm viability and the skills I received from having to write my own working lands grant um, all of that is still being put to use today and um, I feel like it's giving me added revenue too because I'm I'm writing grants for other people and hopefully that those grants will will help support those foresters and those farmers to keep their land um, being viable. That's my story. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. From bread and butter. Yes, indeed. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Mike Breyer, and I own and operate. Uh, Blank Page Cafe, which is a small micro business uh, operating at Bread and Butter Farm. I'm here representing not only my business today, but also Bread and Butter Farm on behalf of Corey Pierce, who owns Bread and Butter Farm, who couldn't make it today, and she's on a much needed and well deserved mini vacation with her family. Um, firstly, I'd like to express my gratitude to not only this committee, but Lynn Owen and the folks at Working Lands and Sam Smith at Farm Viability, uh, all of whom provide us with a deep level of inspiration and validation for all of the work that we're doing. Uh, Bread and Butter Farm has about 600 acres of land under management located primarily in Shelburne and South Burlington. We're uniquely positioned very close to population density, that being Burlington in Chittenden County. And our primary agricultural product is 100% grass-fed beef, pastured organic pork, and 
vegetable production, uh, organic vegetable production. We also have what we like to call diversified farm operation in that at Bread and Butter Farm, there are a number of educational programming, uh, educational programs happening, all with agriculture and land management and sort of the core of that curriculum. We regard ourselves as, as land stewards first and then operating businesses around that principle uh, almost all the time, secondarily. Um, my cafe is located in the farm store at Bread and Butter Farm. We sell the majority of our product in a retail context in a very small farm store that um, that is located in what was a milking part of a, of, a, of a dairy barn. And what's really cool about what we're doing is that um, through my presence and my business at the farm, we're able to provide folks who visit the farm with a one-on-one -on -one interaction with somebody who's familiar with the farm and its products and can speak to what we're doing and why we regard it as uh, a valuable tool for the community. And that, we've noticed, has really helped increase uh, not only our market share and the immediate community that we serve, but also uh, the market share for folks visiting Vermont. This Working Lands grant, uh, we received $20,000 last year for uh, very much needed infrastructure improvements related to uh, a small expansion of our kitchen area within the farm store. And the way I think about it is, as many of you know, operating a small food business or a small food and farming business, oftentimes funding infrastructure improvements specifically from ongoing operations can be really difficult. And what the Working Lands Grant has enabled us to do is really quantify the inspiration and the creative visioning that is oftentimes part of our long-term strategic planning process. And what I mean by that is we oftentimes will have these creative visions for what the farm could and we think should be. And it's oftentimes very unclear and we're unsure of how to get from point A to point B. And the Working Lands Grant has really helped bridge that gap and has provided us with some some fi financial support to take meaningful steps in that direction. And so that for us has been invaluable and the resources are being specifically dedicated towards these infrastructure improvement projects that will help us create, I heard the word capacity being mentioned, create the capacity to be able to A, reach more people, operate our businesses more efficiently, and a common theme here and common thread is hire more people. Um, my business, my small micro business has operated um, with just me and one part-time employee and we're poised in the very near term this year over the next six months to hire two additional employees plus several additional part-time employees uh, both season seasonally. The farm has about five full-time employees year-round and 15 to 20 seasonally to support various um, events and, um, and just to accommodate the work demands of the season. So. Yeah, we, we, uh, we're tremendously grateful for all of this work. We, uh, we think soil regeneration, ecosystem building, and creating a vibrant foothold for our community with regards to not only where food comes from, but also a place where folks can feel comfortable uh, being on a farm and spending time at a farm and understanding what happens on a production farm. We think creating those opportunities for our community members is, is very important. And we've seen the transformative effect of creating those opportunities, not only for um, community members who are purchasing our food to customers, but also the, uh, the next generation through some of our educational programs. We see that, we see that transformative power uh, manifest in a lot of the kiddos that we work with around you know, you know, being uh, and working in concert with the land and really appreciating animal production um, from, from an entire supply chain perspective. And so for us, becoming a little bit more vertically integrated, creating opportunities for myself as a micro business to become a wholesale account for the farm will create the uh, sort of necessary impetus for the farm to grow and expand the, agric the agricultural operations 
especially with some recently new, uh, recently acquired land that we plan to work very closely with Sam Smith on and developing sort of a strategic plan for the direction of how that will integrate under the fold of Bread and Butter Farm. And we look forward to uh, continuing to work with folks at Working Lands and this, this group to play, uh, play a collaborative role in how the agricultural economy in Vermont continues to transform and evolve. Right. Yeah. And I would add, if you ever get a chance, and there's a number of places around Vermont that have wonderful burger nights in the summer, and I know that's part of their operation. It's, you know, four or five, four or five times a year they get together, they're sprinkled around Vermont, and that's part of what uh, I think is important for these operations to be made viable is to invite people onto the farms. And I know they have a lot of school children that come as well. So yeah. absolutely, appreciate it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so, um, before the rules. Yeah. yeah, no rules. Yeah. <laughs> so, there you go. Mateo's here, and Mateo has got a story, and um, it seems like he just started the other day, but he's now, what, 15 years old? I'm about to be 17. About 17. <laughs> yeah. So, but he's a mature company now, but um, he can tell his story. Um, thank you for having us in. Um, I just, um, before I, I get off on a tangent here, I want to appreciate uh, the Working Lands uh, Enterprise Board, uh, specifically. This program, um, I think, is a model um, and needs to be uh, considered the beginning of uh, something. Um, I don't think that the impact, um, I think the impact can really be scaled. You know, and I, I understand that's a question of resources, but we're in a moment in agriculture in Vermont where uh, communities um, and states that invest are going to uh, thrive and survive, and um, uh, places that don't are going to wither away. And um, you know, I know there aren't uh, endless dollars, but I believe that the working landscape is probably the best investment <coughs> that um, that you can make. So. Um, Andy and I started milking, Andy's my brother, um, and I wouldn't be here without him. He's back there doing all the hard work. <laughs> um, we started um, milking cows in 2003. We bought uh, the farm um, in 1998. It was an emotional, irrational decision. We had no idea what we were going to do with it. Dot-com bubble was inflating real estate values, and uh, we took uh, some time to uh, try and figure out uh, what we needed out of life, and uh, Jasper Hill is part of a three-pronged uh, approach um, to satisfy intrin intrinsic needs, meaningful work in a place that we love with people that we love. And so the meaningful work part for us um, is around um, developing the economic mechanisms to support the working landscape. Uh, five, uh, six years ago now, we went through a visioning process. Um, previously, it had been like Vermont, and we've basically uh, shrunk it down to a 15-mile radius of where we are. Uh, our goal is to build a market, um, to build a pipeline to that market in which we can put high-value products and suck cash out of places where there's plenty of it and uh, redistribute it in a way that commodity markets don't or can't or won't. And um, we started tracking um, our expenses um, four years ago by zip code. And um, you know, there's a lot of waves of cash that flow in and, and most of, mostly flow out of our business. We're not a wildly profitable uh, business. We're, um, you know, somewhere in the between 4 and 5 percent uh, like return on um, our capital. Um, you know, profit is not the purpose. Profit serves the purpose, and the purpose is to build livable communities, right? Um, so Craftsbury, Glover, Greensboro, and Hardwick is pre pretty much, you know, um, the, our natural community and our natural uh, landscape, and um, we're building all kinds of enterprises and trying and failing, uh, trying again at uh, uh, 
uh, ways where we can create value through value-added businesses. We started a value-added uh, pork business a couple of years ago, so we're also making um, dry-cured uh, salamis. Um, this past year, um, we uh, started, uh, but we bought Oak Knoll uh, Dairy, uh, the goats, uh, the bottling equipment, and the brand, um, and partnered with a couple from California who moved out uh, a year ago, um, this past summer, we built the barns and moved the goats up and built a bottling plant. And uh, they were milking a thousand goats in California. Um, so they're, they're plugged into our whole situation in Hardwick now up on Bridgman Hill, Bridgman Hill Farm. Um, and it feels like we're just getting going. Um, we uh, uh, make we, we milk uh, cows on two farms and uh, 230 cows at Andersonville Farm in, um, in Glover, uh, 45 cows on our home farm in Greensboro, and this morning I think we milked 280 goats at Bridgman, and we buy milk from uh, two neighbors in Greensboro, um, where and we process uh, that milk into cheese in two facilities, the Vermont Food Venture Center, where we're the anchor tenant and a creamery at Jasper Hill Farm. We ripen cheese at the cellars at Jasper Hill at, uh, in Greensboro. Uh, this past year we produced about um, 400 tons, so around 800,000 pounds of cheese uh, from our, um, our, our cells, and we ripened about 400 tons of cheese for other producers, including the Von Trapp Farmstead, Scalton Family Farm, uh, Landaff Creamery in Landaff, New Hampshire, Cabot, um, Shelburne Farms, um, and we're we're full. So we've got a couple of big projects on the dashboard: the Yellow Barn Accelerator, a uh, business accelerator in Hardwick, which I'm really <coughs> hopeful is going yeah. to happen. Uh, but that'll be a big leap forward for us. So, you know, our goal really is to. Uh, uh, create some vibrancy where we live, right? Um, 15 years ago, it wasn't clear that Willie's store in Greensboro was viable or uh, was gonna survive, um, that schools were going to uh, be there when our kids, uh, you know, were ready to go to them. And um, so these are just some of the priorities. Cheese for us is just a lever that we're yanking on to try and transform uh, our community and uh, make it more livable. It's a fabulous lover. It's a fabulous lover. Lover, yeah. yeah. So, um, so it starts with a mission, and our mission is to be the number one thing to be the standard bearer uh, for quality and innovation in the artisan cheese industry because we can't compete on price. We're not a low cost producer. We have no interest in competing on price. Our only uh, comparative advantage is quality, period. So that's like a religion for us, because right? it's, uh, it's the only way that I believe uh, Vermont and agriculture in Vermont is going to be able to survive over the long term, because we are not a low cost producer of anything here. Um, so if we can't uh, focus on quality, we're, we're, we're cooked. Um, and I got to say one thing, and that is that uh, it Something I've been thinking a lot about lately is that uh, pricing uh, drives scale. And uh, what's happened in the dairy industry specifically over the last few years um, is really problematic because um, equity is transferred from rural communities to uh, urban and suburban uh, populations through pricing mechanisms. And uh, what we're left with is um, uh, balance sheets um, where there's actual equity that's being transferred um, over uh, just a few years, uh, the millions. hundreds of millions of dollars that have been transferred out of rural Vermont uh, to urban and suburban communities through a pricing mechanism is really problematic. I believe that the future for um, dairy specifically and the working landscape, if we want to keep it, is going to be paying farmers <coughs> for environmental services. And um, just got back from Switzerland 
and uh, milk and cheese is a byproduct of, um, of, of a farming system there that is really directed towards the conservation of their working landscape. And uh, between 50 and 60 percent of the farmer's income in Switzerland comes from uh, grazing their cows on Alps. Yep. So, anyway. If you, uh, oh, and we have uh, 104 employees uh, this morning. Yeah, so we, we, we started. Uh, we started with my brother Andy and I, and uh, 18 months later, our wives uh, forsook their careers. We would not be with where we are if it wasn't for the sacrifices of the ladies in our life. They really got us over the hump. And um, um, we're, yeah, we're, it feels like we're grown ups now. Don't <laughs> worry. Yeah, and I'd be happy to answer any yeah. questions. How about that microbiology lab? Oh, yes. Right, the whole reason I'm here. So in 2013, uh, we got a Working Lands uh, grant for $50,000. Um, uh, we put up 100 grand and we built uh, a microbiology lab. Uh, this came on the heels of five uh, years of research uh, that happened inside our business by microbiologists, um, systems biologists at, uh, from Harvard. Uh, who used cheese as a model system to understand uh, uh, microbial communication. And uh, they basically, a uh, cheese is an accessible, um, you know, a medium, it's reproducible. Uh, and they use the rinds of our cheese to study uh, microbial ecology uh, to, and to look at how uh, microbes communicate, right? What, the, uh, what genes produce what chemicals that make up microbial communication. And as part of that process, uh, thousands of samples were taken and sequenced and we got to understand how uh, the ecology uh, on the rinds of our cheeses uh, works. And we basically uh, took um, hundreds of samples that were collected from our uh, raw milk, from our cheese, from our environment. Uh, these are interesting strains, uh, cheese making strains that are indigenous to um, our uh, farm and our process. And we banked them. Um, and uh, we're producing now a fully a wild indigenous uh, uh, cheese made with microbes that are uh, that have originated within um, our farming system. Um, we're able now. We have two full-time microbiologists working in the lab now, and uh, we're able. Uh, I used to describe being a cheese maker as being like God, except you're dumb and blind, uh, <laughs> because we're unleashing these universes of life and then like wiping them out, and that's basically what cheese is. Um, and, but now uh, I, I describe it as being like uh, God, uh, no longer blind but still dumb because we don't necessarily fully understand exactly what's going on but we can see what's happening in our product now. It's really incredible. Um, the part of the business plan had been to like try and figure out how to provide services for other um, uh, producers and we've done some of that, um, although that, that part of uh, the business plan um, never, never, or at least hasn't taken off yet, but um, it's been a huge driver for quality um, at Jasper Hill, and we're able to do things that uh, even very large cheese companies uh, can't even uh, dream about. So uh, thank you for that. Very yes. cool. Yeah. Uh, Chris? Uh, you guys, I, 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 many of us were at your presentation at the Dairy, uh, Dairy Summit. Summit last year up in Jay, and it stuck with me, particularly this picture you have of the of your uh, store downtown, of sort of dilapidated and, yeah. and now refurbished as a way of uh, just the example of what you've been able to bring to the community. And, and there's no question that um, you know, we're all very proud of your business, I think. Um, but I, I'm curious, you know, up your way too is Lawson's Brewery, um, and and we have these these sort of um, exemplary businesses that are highly dependent on local agriculture, um, and we have to have those sort of as anchors in a sense. 
But I've sort of joked if we're all, if local ag is all about cheese and beer, you know, we're kind of in trouble mm -hmm. at some level too because it is about, we have to reorient the local in terms of food, right? Um, we can't, we're not going to sit here in 20 years and import tomatoes from California if we're successful, I think. The, the climate's not going to let us do that, I believe. Yeah. And so I wonder if you can, it, 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 it's sort of at odds, or, or how does it complement the statement that I totally agree with, where you've said, you know, we have to be about quality because um, we're not going to compete on price. And how do we fit that with the fact that a third of Vermonters are struggling in poverty? And so I, I would love your help in thinking that through. Maybe it's not just today, but. I'm sure you've thought of some of these dynamics. And, and so you're you're, uh, you're talking about like the cost of uh, like the products that we're producing, and like kind of being um, like high value, high cost. Yeah, so not necessarily accessible. And it has to fit yeah. in in our yeah. in a strong yeah. ag economy, yeah. but but it also can't be what we're all shooting for. I don't think. Um, so my my response to that because we've been. Uh, Criticized really um, uh, openly by some. Don't hear me no, say no, that. No, no, no. Uh, okay. Because you know that uh, we couldn't survive making cheap food, right? <laughs> cheap food is part of the problem. Absolutely. Uh, you know, with agriculture. Yeah. Um, our goal is to uh, pay people uh, enough within our community so they can afford to consume the products that we produce and. And, and we do that. We, um, you know, when we started our business, the median income in Greensboro was uh, just over eighteen thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Uh, this is like household income. Yeah. All right. And uh, um, we just went through um, uh, a housing survey. As part of that, we got some demographic information. And in the last uh, ten years, uh, we've gone from about. Um, uh, 20,000 to 36,000, and our median income is around 45,000 in, inside our business. Uh, that's for an employee. Yep. So that's how, that's how we're going about trying to address that particular uh, question, and um, it's not something one business can solve, but it's part of, uh, I, so, uh, I saw some incredible things in Switzerland, and I hope I can come talk to you about Tell them what the farmers drive for vehicles. So have. the average farm size, 24 cows, okay? Uh, BMWs in, in the driveway, and uh, the, the value that society there places on being able to walk in the Alps, okay? Um, and the identity um, that's in, inherent and is and originates with the working landscape there is something that um, Swiss people are willing to pay for. Yeah. Okay. And uh, how do you uh, make sh what we live in is a trickle up economy where um, yeah. resources are trickling up to a thousand people and they're trickling out of our communities, right? We're trying to reverse that by trickling, uh, trickling it back in to our community and spreading it around. And uh, that's that that works. But you're right; it doesn't it it doesn't work for everybody. And I think that um, the challenge is going to be to change the fundamentals of farm income in Vermont if you want to conserve the working landscape and make sure that you know people in rural communities. <coughs> Are, are getting paid. Just so we're clear, I, I don't think it's on your business. No, no. I, I think as policymakers, we have to figure out how we're able to balance the, the high-end, high-performers that are having clearly an awesome impact on our economy and you know the need to frankly produce more of our own food and make sure people in the market can buy it. Do you attract many visitors to the hard work? Uh, area we have question. no place within our company where a consumer a civilian can interface with our brand it's uh, uh, we uh, we consider ourselves to be exporters um, and uh, we see uh, a need 
to build some kind of uh, place where people can can come and have an experience. Um, but I think that's going to be in the that's in the five to ten year plan for us. Terry had his hand up. Uh, Terry. I remember at the dairy summit we were talking about the housing shortage. I wondered if you had any uh, solution to that or because of the conserved property. Um, so part of the challenge in Greensboro is uh, around wastewater infrastructure and zoning, right? So we've got 10 acre zoning. Um, and then you've got Greensboro Bend where uh, there's uh, very uh, depreciated housing stock, and I use the word depreciated in the most polite <laughs> sense of the word. Um, and it's impossible to see how uh, we can get uh, where we're, you know, had to revitalize the housing stock there without wastewater infrastructure because of the Lamoille River and uh, flood zone issues. And so um, we worked with um, Paul, who is a personal hero of mine, <laughs> um, yeah. in the town of Greensboro on a community visioning uh, project. And one of the things that uh, came out of, there were four, four things that came out of that, but wastewater infrastructure uh, uh, was the number one uh, thing because it is uh, the linchpin to try and solve some of the uh, housing issues. Uh, I think we're going to lose our school. Um, we've had, uh, in the past uh, four years, we've had over 20 families with children move to our community and uh, with children, and zero of them live in Greensboro because there's nowhere to live, right? And uh, so we're, we're working on it. I hope it's not too late for uh, Lakeview uh, Elementary School. That's the one in, in, in the band? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's the elementary school is in the village of Greensboro, but it draws oh. standard, and um, <laughs> most of the kids are, uh, are That's a pretty the, nice school. It is, but our numbers uh, dropped under 50 uh, this year. So it's, it's a problem, and it, it's not because there aren't uh, young people with children around. There's just nowhere for them to live in our town. They live in Crassberry Glover. Vicki? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I was just going to ask exactly what Terry asked. Okay. So thank yeah. you, Matthew. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that Federal Milk Inspector been to see you lately? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, uh, they're on their list. Yeah. yeah. They show up uh, right on time. One, one <laughs> problem uh, that we have that we we as state policy makers uh, you talked about walking through the Alps and one issue we've run into this winter is uh, Kingdom Trails which is a little bit east of Newport uh, they're in danger of losing some of their trails because uh, they have, may have to put some of their private landowners uh, the trails through Act 250. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it makes no sense. We should be adding to these trails and welcoming uh, the people with the money. Bring it up and we can keep a little yeah. of it. I, I absolutely agree. And Greensboro um, and uh, Crassberry Outdoor Center Highland <laughs> Lodge uh, trail systems. Uh, I believe that's the future of, uh, that's going to be an important component of the future of the economy of where we are. In our, yeah, in your uh, section. Um, so we're working away at that and trying to fix it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And just jump right in. Tell your story, sir. All right. Uh, good morning. Thanks so much. We're glad to move beyond the field into the forest. And I have suddenly a trick question for you. This is 
a table, it's chairs, it's game pieces, it's wainscoting, it's windows, it's many, many products. It's also a nice piece of maple, and it also doesn't know state boundaries. This grows in upstate New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and beyond that. And so when we think about the forest and we think about the working landscape, from my organization's perspective, it is beyond this state. But I thought I'd have to compete with food samples, so I brought her some show and tell. I pass this around as a nice piece of wood. Can't combine that. Exactly. Not too many teeth marks. So, uh, Northern Forest Center is a 22-year-old organization working across four states in the Northern Forest, from, as I said, from upstate New York across uh, the Adirondacks into Vermont, New Hampshire, and two-thirds of Northern Maine. Our focus is really on the, on the forest economy. How do we create viable jobs within uh, wood products manufacturing, wood heat, and outdoor recreation. All those are incredible values that produce jobs and create vibrant communities if we do it right. Um, over the last three years, we've been uh, a, a benefit uh, or beneficiary of the Working Land Service Provider Grant, and we've provided, uh, in turn, a number of services to wood products companies across the state. Um, over uh, just the last two years, our partnership with um, the Woodworks Council and a direct grant to ourselves um, has resulted in our delivery of services to 14 companies that employ over 550 people, have $128 million in gross sales, and utilize 21 and a half million board feet. So when you want to talk about scale and impact, these are a collection of 14 companies that in aggregate are using quite a bit of labor, producing a lot of value, and using a lot of wood from the region. Three different quick stories I want to share with you and how we provide our services. Number one, and some of you may know uh, Ken Ganya from Ganya Lumber down in, uh, down state near about Pittsburgh, Pitt, uh, outside of Rutland. Yep. Yeah. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, thank you. Um, we helped him secure, we love funding from you all for his power transition this past year from diesel fuel to three phase power on the grid. That was huge in his transformation in greening his company, but also setting up a more sustainable path from a financial perspective so he could look long-term at succession planning and maintaining that mill in his production in the state. Second is us providing direct technical assistance to companies like Vermont down in Wilder, Britain Lumber and Fairley, and built by Newport up in Newport. We've helped with lean manufacturing principles, business planning, financing, management coaching, and these are all of larger employers. We on the service provider side, with some of your direction by staff, are well coordinated as to the viability program on the, on the smaller microenterprise side. As we move up, we've been really filling the niche with some of the larger, larger businesses. One of the other things we've done this last year was actually to convene CEOs together and we're calling the Northern Forest Board Forum. Some of you all know that if you're working as an individual business and entrepreneur, it's a lonely endeavor. And when you get together with others, you can trade a lot of trade secrets, if you will, um, coach each other, mentor each other. Um, but we have uh, eight different companies that participated. Appalachian Engineered Flooring up in your neighborhood. Uh, Timber Homes, Vermont and Montpelier. New England Woodcraft down in Brandon. Treehouse Hardwoods and Mill Shop in South Burlington. Andrew Pierce Bowles in Hartland. Linden Furniture in London. And built by Newport up in Newport. We're entering, entering the second year of this program, and what we're finding is that each of these companies are not only getting assistance from our staff and our coaches, but getting a lot of assistance from each other. They're building business connections peer-to-peer, -peer, and they're looking at things like ERP systems. They're, that's an enterprise resource planning system. Um, a peer-to-peer -peer advice basically saved one company $150,000 on not buying the wrong product. Seems like a pretty good savings to me. Um, we're also in a couple other areas that I think are really critical when we think about the overall health and vitality of the wood products sector in the forest economy. As some of you know, that piece of board uh, comes out of not a square log, but a round piece of wood, right, a log. On the edges are pallet wood. On the other edges are, are uh, uh, bark. In the middle are chips. All those go on to other value-added products. So we see wood heat as a way for, to support the uh, state to achieve its climate goals, but also to help support low-grade wood markets that are vastly critical to local civil cultural practices. You all know that, but it's like weeding carrots out of the garden. You can't just take the best ones. The other ones do not produce long-term in sequestering carbon, carbon keeping uh, water clean, and so on. Other piece I want to mention is uh, mass timber construction, wood insulation, new advances of, of wood. 
We and our partners in, in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, with the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund and others, and in New York, are really looking at this regional wood basket of 26 million acres. And how can we really provide value-added value jobs and products out of that to serve the nearly 100 million people within a day's drive? So, the benefits of forest stewardship obviously go well beyond just wood products manufacturing and the companies that I've shared with you. It does go into the recreation economy. And I also want to say that because of our able to, ability to look across four states, I would compliment you all on just saying that the Working Lands Enterprise Board is unique in its northern New England neighbors, particularly of New Hampshire and Maine. There is nothing like this that exists. And I'd say that state policy showing that and, and providing funding is a clear commitment to the working lands. You all know this. Other states look enviable at you all to be able to get that legislative done. Thanks to Paul, thanks to many others. So I congratulate you on that and appreciate the partnership. Happy to take questions. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> no, appreciate your working with Dalton Newport and Appalachian Flooring. Yeah. Great outfits. Yeah. What about Columbia? Do you do anything with them? We have not. The scale they work at is kind of beyond us yeah. a bit, you know, um, and they're working more in that larger commodity <laughs> space. I mean, as agriculture, you know, same as in wood products, you work on commodity side stuff and you're in a whole different, yeah. you know, ball game, if you will. Do you ever co partner with, um, like, uh, generating facilities where the mill could use a dry kiln and in where you get heat, say, from a wood fire generator, they could build kilns there to dry wood, or is that? Absolutely, the co-location of facilities like that to use efficient use of waste heat, electric generation on site is absolutely where we need to go to in the future to stabilize those energy costs. Most of the examples that I can cite off the top of my head are in Maine right now, um, but I'd say that as we work and get closer into some of these different companies, particularly some of the sawmills in the state here, um, there is ample opportunity for increasing efficiencies and looking at that cost control that is really that, that very little margins that these companies have. So, we, we're in the process, uh, Chris's other committees, of relicensing like Rygate. And they have a tremendous amount of heat uh, that could be utilized for kilns or some other process, uh, greenhouses. Uh, Absolutely. And it would be great to, to you know, co-locate. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I just take a moment here because I think one of the challenges that we face when we talk about wood heat uh, compared to biomass electric generation is those are very distinctive energy efficiencies, as you know, and very different carbon calculations. An independent study we, we commissioned talked about 50% better on greenhouse gas emissions from wood heat compared to fossil fuels. We don't have that same benefit on the electric generation side. So the more we can capture that waste heat and create those efficiencies is both a business benefit but also a climate benefit. So we have talked to some of the folks at Rygate and are, are trying to figure out where we can be helpful. Oh, Vicki had a question. I'm sorry, I just didn't hear where you live, Rob. You're helping the Northeast Kingdom. It sounds like you're networking in a large radius. Places, but where are you based? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a, um, a secret. I sneaked over the Connecticut River on my way here. I'm actually living in exile. I grew up down, up down in Andover on Marsh Hill Road, and uh, so I'm, I'm actually our headquarters is in Concord. We have staff people scattered across our broad region, and uh, our wood products provider actually uh, lives up in St. Johnsbury. But this is not. A, this is almost as good as looking at PowerPoint, but this is our, our map of a region, 26 million acres. So people say, where do I work? And I say, it's in, a, it's in the car. Um, but we've got a great staff and a great sense of uh, group of partners, so um, we extend as, as well as we can across the region. And I find that my two hour drive here is probably similar to some folks coming from Brattleboro or down south. That's right. So yeah, we travel a lot, but it's that regional perspective we find is really helpful to connect the, the states beyond their borders. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much. Great, thank you. Yeah. Senator Jones, if you don't mind, I just wanted to make a quick note of time. You're respectful. I know someone's coming in at 11. We have Sam Smith here from the Federal Center. Gwen Piccolo from Central and Enterprise did not come. One of her clients might be here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, if I don't have time to read the note from Parker Nichols from Vermont Wildwoods, I will send it electronically. Um, but we certainly do, we'd like to hear from um, Deputy Commissioner Sam Lincoln. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Great.
Great morning. Good morning. Uh, morning. It's nice to be back here again, speaking with you folks. Uh, so, I'm Sam Smith. I work for the Intervale Center, uh, and I'm the director of agricultural services there. I also do a lot. Of, I, my office is also my car uh, because we work statewide, and um, so we we provide business planning services uh, through funding from the Working Lands Ent Enterprise Board, and then also through the Vermont farm and forest viability program to about 100 farms a year, farm businesses. Um, we provide those services from concept to exit. So I primarily spend a lot of time doing transfer succession planning right now. And um, I'd like to thank all of you sort of for your vision and, and for Paul, well Paul's gone, but for the vision around this program and the support that it provides, not only for organizations like ours to do this type of work, but also to the numerous farms that have been the recipient, recipients of these grant funds. Um, you know, this is sort of, uh, it was just said that we're looked at as a model, and when I go out, I just got back from the National Farm Viability Conference in Minnesota, which was partially put on by our farm viability team, and we're looked at as a model nationally for the type of initiatives that we have going on in the state. And this is one of those initiatives. Uh, people are really envious of us. And, um, and so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I could talk about, you know, we have had a huge number of contacts with the WeWeb funding in terms of our organization, but also the farms that I work with. Um, when I talked about that spectrum of farms that we work with, um, when I first started the Intervale, which was probably seven or eight years ago, we had a farm viability contract that allowed us to work with 20 farms a year. Um, and that contract was limited to working with those farms. They had to be in a certain stage of business, and they, the, the planning process takes two years in that program, so it's relatively intensive. Um, and we received some working lands funds back um, in a partner grant with a couple other organizations I think in 2015 or 2016, that allowed us to start to leverage funds to provide services to the sort of concept or newer beginning farmers that um, we, we actually do a lot of work with now. So if we look at our current sort of 100 farmers a year, I would say probably 60 of those are in the co like concept and startup phase. And those are not farms that we work through farm viability funding with. So uh, we've received uh, several working land service provider grants over the last three or four years, and they're, they've been for a relatively small percentage of our budget, but they allow us to work with these farms in really distinct, uh, short engagements that allow us to do, we call it coaching, but basically get them started off on the right foot. So we help vet their concepts before they get into business, or in that early stage of business, yeah, and then instill some values in terms of business management. Um, we have a portion of the funds that's set aside for technical assistance so we can hire consultants to come in. The, probably the biggest one with this group is we try to get them into QuickBooks so that they have good financial data moving forward because I think all of you know that our agricultural sector is changing and the far, a, a lot of the entrepreneurs you heard from today, they are business people first, farmers second. And that's what we're really trying to instill. As we move away from the commodity markets, our, our farm business owners have to have a whole new skill, set of skills. So I just wanted to share a couple stories. Uh, well, one in particular, I have two farms that came up as I was sort of looking through the list of the farms we've worked through in terms of the working lands funds. And one of them is, uh, one of them was a Working Lands Grant recipient, and that's the Bear Roots Farm. And uh, they're currently in Williamstown, but they just opened up the Roots Market, um, which is in Middlesex. If you haven't been there, I, I think this is the future. You, uh, Senator Pearson, you asked that question about how do we get food into the hands of people with uh, lower incomes, or how do we make food ex accessible for our local populations? And I've been working with a number of farms uh, in the past year or so that have really decided that they're going to commit to the direct local market. And that is a good example of a farm that really has, they bought a retail space, 
and they outfitted it, and it's a year-round operation, and they're providing vegetables year-round, and they're at a relatively accessible price point. Great. So I think that that's sort of the future of where we're headed. They received a working lands grant. We provided them with business yeah. planning support, and they're, I think they're really poised to be successful in that. You know, they've bought two farms in the state so far, and that's all been in the span. I worked with them, right, when they moved here in 2013, right? So, and then the other farm is Old Road Farm, um, and they're in Granville, and I look back, and they were one of our original Working Lands coaching clients back in 2017. And we sat down with them and did a little bit of business planning, taught them how to do a cash flow, uh, and they're in the, they're now, uh, poised to purchase a property um, that really, and when we talk about our rural community and our rural economy, the small farms that will be the hub of employment and the sort of community culture that we need in our rural towns, those farms have to be anchored by these really strong business people who have a vision to provide a product that, that can be sold direct or to regional markets that can provide a living wage for them and their employees. So um, once again, I'd like to say thank you for, for doing this and <clears throat> providing the guidance. And, um, and thank you, Lynn Ellens, for letting me speak today. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I always love to come back and talk to you about farm viability and business planning. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any questions? Well, thank you for your time. My name is Jetta Mandel Abramson. Um, I was a beneficiary, I guess, of um, the Working Lands Enterprise Grant uh, for the Center for Women and Entrepreneurship. Um, it was a wonderful business class I got to take, thanks to you all. Um, really benefited me as a, I had no business experience before um, taking this class and writing the business plan had been excruciatingly difficult for me. Um, I got to take this class and it was great. So um, my husband and I are a startup saffron farm in Newberry, Vermont, and um, we focus on regenerative agricultural practices um, in order to, you know, preserve our planet, um, sequester carbon, build soil for our saffron, and um, we we're small at the moment. Uh, this will be our first. Um, well, this is our expansion year, I guess. We'll be planting our first acre this summer, which is ex very exciting. Um, we have a 10-year plan to expand into nine acres total on our farm in Newberry. Um, we will be uh, introducing a small ruminator herd, probably of sheep and goats, um, in order to build soil and sequester carbon um, on our property. and. Uh, we'd like to eventually sort of move into the agro-tourism industry a little bit, uh, building cabins to um, host cooking classes as well as regenerative agriculture classes on our property. And um, eventually we'll have, if everything goes according to plan, which it will, um, <laughs> We'll have about 30 to 40 employees on our property, um, seasonally, of course, as saffron is harvested and processed uh, once a year. So we'll have about um, two months out of the year we'll, where we'll, we'll be um, hosting about 30 to 40 seasonal employees. So um, we are in the stage currently of finding funding for our project um, and as I mentioned, that business class that um, you folks afforded us was um, integral in, in the ability for us to, to build our, our business plan and, um, and be able to find funding for our project. So that's sort of where we're at. So you, you live in Barry? Newberry. Oh, in Newberry. Newberry. Yep. Yeah. 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 A good farming country. All Indeed, yes, yeah. especially for saffron. It takes a lot of a lot of little crocuses to mix. <laughs> yeah, it's between 150 and 200 flowers per gram. Yes. Wow. <laughs> so 28.3 grams per ounce. That's correct. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> I'm a dyer. That's all I'm yeah. yeah. And UVM is doing a lot of research with um, saffron, yeah. so 
and especially crop block grant has been supported that. I think you have a conference coming up in That's March, right. March, yes, so. yes. Uh, yeah, we've been in close contact with the folks uh, at UVM uh, for several years, and we've been experimenting on our property uh, for the last two. Um, so we're, we're quite confident in our, in the next step forward. Cool. So. Thank well, thank, thanks. Oh, John, John. Did you have a no, quick question? Going further, since we've been talking about this, what are the, the processing, because hemp's running into a lot of processing problems, um, oh. and marketing challenges ahead for saffron, even if you can grow great saffron. Yeah, so our marketing uh, techniques are, we're, we're going to be selling our product primarily in bulk, um, so wholesale. Uh, we will reserve a few ounces uh, to sell retail um, to local clientele farmers markets, and. Um, we've been quite successful actually selling by the quarter gram and gram thus far um, with the product that we've grown so far. Um, but we plan on bringing, we're going to be actually this coming month, we'll be bringing samples down to a variety of farm to table restaurants um, in Vermont, but also out of state, Boston, New York City, um, to clients who have uh, expressed interest already in, in purchasing bulk saffron from us. Um, so our marketing strategy is more or less uh, going door to door, face to face samples, um, and then non binding contracts. So for purchase for next year, um, and then hopefully these clients will also be able to grow with us um, as we will be scaling up. We should have about five pounds this coming year, um, and then of course by the time we have nine acres, we'll have considerably more than that. So um, we are hoping to have clients that are able to scale up with us. Um, luckily. Um, there are a lot of farm to table restaurants in Vermont, which is wonderful. So we have quite a few clients already who are um, hoping to purchase saffron from us, uh, which is wonderful. And um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Processing. Oh yeah, processing. Um, so in our fourth year, we plan on expanding into two more acres. So we'll have three acres, harvesting three acres in our fourth year growing season. Um, and then two acres per year after that. So in our fifth year, we will, um, we will actually be building a processing plant and drying facility on our property, um, which will take significant resources, but I'm sure that when the time comes, we will have that all worked out. <laughs> maybe, maybe with a grant for you. <laughs> so. Or at least buy the front door to the place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you and good luck. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, spending time this, uh, this time here today with this group. Um, the working lands in Vermont are going through a period of extreme transition uh, with our, our global economy changing, uh, rewarding the lowest cost producer and as it was put earlier that Vermont's not a low cost producer of anything. Um, historically for generations, centuries, Vermont's working lands uh, uh, businesses, our farms and forest businesses have produced commodities that they plugged into a pipeline where they were had value added and, and were turned into consumer goods elsewhere. And, there's this great transition as we see that that model is not uh, always going to work for various sectors of uh, Vermont's uh, rural economy. And the Working Lands Initiative, uh, supported by you, created by you, and the, the other branch of the government, um, is the hub. Uh, I can't state anywhere near as well as the many people you've heard sit here today the, the hurdles they've overcome, the challenges they face. Uh, the expectations for how they manage their businesses, whether how they engage with the environment, uh, how they uh, manage employees, all these, these great transitions that these businesses are facing as they maintain the vistas, the working lands, the environment that we have, and your support for that is uh, uh, greatly important, as, and as well as the funding that you put into these businesses, as well as the policy considerations that all of you have in front of you and your committees that, that uh, affect these, these business owners across the state. So we're, we're very proud of the work that's gone on here collaboratively, and um, we, uh, um, you know, the, the, the many things with the, the targeted focus with the private sector business owners that are on this board we are uh, as commissioner Snyder said earlier are uh, adapting and being as nimble as possible to change and address this we've made a lot of changes in the last few years to the 
the ways that the money is spent and where it's focused to help uh, create opportunities for people to uh, successfully navigate this transition in the economy, the rural economy. Um, in just a few days, uh, the Working Lands Enterprise Board is going to announce funding for 26 businesses for grants, putting out some of the $1.6 million that you all uh, provided in funding. And um, I know that, again, in the last few years, some of these businesses, um, there's, there's hope on the horizon for the way that this money is being spent, that some of these businesses that were traditional commodity producers, that they're uh, stopping those commodities before they leave the state and adding value to them. And through the grants uh, that will be funded by this board or the, the business planning processes that are funded by this board. Um, and uh, you know, this, this sector employs 80, nearly 80,000 people and it's growing. Um, and it's just such an important part of our, our culture. These are salt of the earth people that work the land and they're our neighbors and our select board members, our business owners and our towns. Uh, and and uh, it's a way of life that we want to sustain very much so. Um, so I, again, uh, thank you very much for, for all your work. This is this between the board and the legislature and the private sector members here. This is really the hub of that transition and uh, I'm pleased to work with you all on that and thank you for your attention to it. Thank you, Sam. Sam. And Sam, I'd like to thank you and, and the other commissioners and secretaries for all the work on Trying, trying and achieving getting the company, workers' compensation yeah. rates yeah. down so our small farmers and small producers can afford to have employees and, and pay at a somewhat reasonable rate. Uh, it's really 30 to 40 percent, I believe, the reduction has been, and that's very good. Well, I'm pleased. Thank you for that, and I'm pleased to uh, always say that there was a great team that worked on it, and others uh, that deserve a lot of credit. Yeah. Um, and I'm pleased to say that after all of the work on it, not only is, that we're now competitive with New York and New Hampshire, a place we weren't four years ago when this started, and. Um, that is due to just a natural reduction in the injuries and claims that have happened on businesses, but also the work of the Department of Financial Regulation. But I consider it foundational uh, when I talk about this, that the workers' comp issue in the forest economy um, is foundational. How do we go to a, a, a parents and say, how will we have your daughter or son work in, a, work in, a, in the most dangerous occupation in the country? if we're not going to train them properly and cover them uh, with the insurance that's required by law. It's foundational to growing that sector of the economy and I'm hopeful that all of our, to get our work together on that will be again transformative as we look at employing more people um, in, in that sector. Um, yep. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Yeah. Is there anything yeah. else? Just, just one final thought. I know we have some board members here, and I just want to, I think it's important we recognize they spend countless hours uh, evaluating the applications, uh, making really difficult decisions. Uh, and I think a few of them here, some of the board members could stand and just say hi. Yeah. yeah. They, uh, they, they spend so much time on it. They really Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everybody. This has been wonderful.